Good morning, uh, good afternoon, everyone. This is a webinar from Wirepass together with a key partner of ours called Symbiotech. It's about massive IoT in months, yes, months and not years. Before we dive into the presentation, just like to go through a few housekeeping. So first and foremost, this webinar is being recorded and will be sent to you automatically. And the presentation will be available in PDF after the webinar as well. Feel free to ask questions throughout the session using the, uh, the uh, GoToWebinar tool on the right hand side there. And uh, any questions will be answered at the end of the webinar. Questions that we don't get a chance to answer will be addressed by email later. Okay, so first and foremost, um, as I say, I'm joined here by uh, Johannes Lehmann from Symbiotech. Maybe, Johannes, you'd like to introduce yourself first. Sure, thanks, Alan. And yeah, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'm Johannes, managing partner of Symbiotic. We're IoT consultants. Um, I'm, I'm going to tell you a lot more about what we do, and it'll become clear throughout the presentation at the end. Um, but I mean, suffice it to say for now that we are, and I, I, I never quite get a straight answer, but I think we might be the, we might be the, 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 the people who've done the most wirepass projects. So nearly, nearly ten projects we've got under our belts. So I think we're the, we might be the original wirepass veterans, but, but I'm not, I'm not quite sure. <laughs> okay, thanks, Johannes. And yeah, my name's Alan Silito. I'm looking after global key accounts here at Wirepass. I've been working for Wirepass for about the last four and a half years. Prior to that, I've had various roles in various semiconductor companies uh, across the world. Regarding today's agenda, uh, we'll basically start off by looking at how companies have leveraged Wirepass to build amazing things. I'll then be handing over to uh, Johannes to talk about how your organization can make or break the project even before it begins. He'll then discuss more about the, the skills needed and the technologies of why, why Wirepass is a great choice. Um, then we'll talk about how Symbiotech has been able to execute time and time again successful IoT projects with Wirepass. And finally, of course, we'll have the Q&A session. So first and foremost, let's talk a little bit about uh, the Wirepass history. So Wirepass itself has been as a company for the last 10 years. In fact, 2020 is our 10-year 10, 10 anniversary, which is a great milestone for us. We are venture capital backed. We have about $25 million of funding. We're currently about 50 people. Now, those 50 people, approximately 50% of them are in the R&D team, and all they do every day is develop the stack, plus look after the tools. So quite a tech-focused company. And geographically, we have uh, locations covering all the way from Australia through India, across into Europe, and then over to the US, with the headquarters and the majority of the staff based here in Tampa, Finland, which is where I'm located right now. But that's not the complete story, because prior to Wirepass becoming the company Wirepass, it actually started 10 years before that, in 2000. It was a university research project at the Technical University of Tampere, and this is where the IP was developed. In terms of the business model, there's been a transition. Uh, initially, when Wirepass was formed, we were doing through end-to-end -end IoT, so hardware, the stack itself, application software, gateway, dashboards, and so on and so forth. We changed this model to focus all our efforts on developing the Wirepass Mesh stack, so now we are a software licensing company. We have about 200 licensees globally, and each licensee has multiple projects running. Now, just to talk about a few of the global world brand companies we're dealing with here, so Maersk, Prologis, and Fujitsu. So when we talk about Maersk, obviously that's a global shipping company. That's one element in a logistics chain. Prologis, these guys have many, many warehouses globally, and they form another part of the logistics chain. And with Fujitsu, we have different projects running across the globe as well. Okay, so let's dive deeper. What is the strategic focus of Wirepass? We focus on four key things. The first one is the connectivity. More specifically here, we're talking about wireless connectivity between things. The things can be smart meters, they can be lights, they can be assets. So we're there to provide the communications pipe. The second is 
Second focus, of course, is software. And to be more specific, the key focus of WirePass is the embedded firmware that sits directly on the silicon, which sits inside the device itself. In addition to the embedded firmware, we do also have a reference gateway software and several tools, which I'll talk about a bit later. Now, in terms of performance, it's all well and good having a network that connects 10 nodes or maybe 100 nodes together. But where WirePass excels is in scalability. We have, for example, multiple networks of, of many, many nodes together, and I'll talk about that a little bit later too. The fourth area is the ecosystem. Now, there are many buzzwords in the IoT. IoT is a buzzword itself, and ecosystem might be another one. But for Wirepass, the ecosystem is absolutely fundamental. Because we're focusing on the core embedded firmware, we've formed relationships over the last four or five years with all sorts of guys, all the way from semiconductor guys, all the way up to dashboard. So Wirepass is designed for massive IoT, and here we're talking about five key things. First one is high performance. High performance in terms of throughput, but also in terms of battery power. Now, it's all well and good if you have a network that's got hundreds of thousands of devices talking together, but how easy is it to install? Do you need to have an RF degree to install a Wirepass network? No, you don't. It's very simple to install and to provision new devices joining. Scale and density. So scale, we have networks out there which have uh, 700,000 items in one mesh, connected, one mesh network with no problems. Density-wise, we're able to, for example, um, do networks which can detect 5,000 items on the back of a pallet within less than one minute. High reliability. Here we're talking about what sort of service level agreement can we offer to our end customers? And here we're able to offer greater than 3.9, so 99.9 .9 and more. Wirepass is able to have a fully battery-powered network, and there we're also able to use that network for doing indoor acid tracking. Okay, so Wirepass Mesh can be used for many different sorts of application, but we've taken a decision to focus on four key verticals. The first vertical is logistics and asset tracking. And for example, I mentioned Maersk and Prologis before, they form two important elements in a logistics chain. And of course, then you need to be talking to people who do pallets, et cetera, et cetera. Within the logistics elements, you have the idea of doing acid tracking indoors at a design, at a distribution center or a factory, for example. The second vertical we look at is smart lighting. And here, yes, it's about connecting luminaires and switches together. That all makes good sense and on, off, dim, fantastic. But really, the expertise and value comes in the beyond element. So lighting and beyond. And by beyond, what I mean is once your lights have been installed, you basically have a very strong IoT backbone for your building, for your factory, which you can then use for acid tracking and censoring. So you can imagine that logistics and acid tracking are coming together with smart lighting. The third area is industrial and general IoT, or as some people like to call it, Industry 4.0. This is where we're working with multiple guys in remote condition monitoring. And I'll show you some use cases about that a bit later. The fourth area is smart metering. This is where we've had a heck of a lot of success. Uh, particularly with the installation in Norway, where there are 700,000 units of meters all connected together in one single mesh network. Okay, this slide is what I like to call the golden slide. We can spend one minute on this or one hour. Obviously, we don't have one hour right now. So what I will do is just go through a few of the key uh, logistic, uh, key technical points. But don't forget, guys, we also have many other webinars on our homepage you can go to refer to where we've taken much deeper dives into the technology. OK, so let's start on the left hand side. That green diamond there is the Wirepass Mesh connectivity software. This is what we've been doing for the last 20 years. If you're familiar with the Aussie seven layer model, we're basically doing layer two, layer three, layer four. So that's Mac, 
routing and transport. That mesh connectivity firmware runs on off-the-shelf silicon from companies such as Nordic Semiconductors and Silicon Labs. As you move above the green diamond, you get to the application. Now, YPass, we at YPass don't do any specific application software because we leave that to our licensees because those guys are the guys who have the skills in their own market. This is where they can differentiate. So lighting guys are licensing YPass mesh and building lighting application. Metering guys are licensing YPass and building uh, metering, metering applications. So there you go. You've got your silicon running YPass mesh with an application running on top of it. This is what goes into the device. The device could be a light, it could be a meter, it could be other things. And it's those things that then start to connect together through YPass mesh. So first and foremost, YPass mesh doesn't require any central controlling software in the gateway or in the back end. No, all the decisions are done locally. And it's this local decision making process that makes the mesh very, very scalable and reliable. What do I mean by local decisions? I'm referring to things such as choosing which frequency channel to use, which power output and so on, and which node to hop to next. Now, as of YPass version 5 that came out a few months ago, you can actually run the mesh connectivity without any gateways, a gatewayless system. And this is particularly important in the uh, lighting space where you want to have the lights and switches all talking together, but you don't necessarily want to connect to the back hole, for example. Then, as you go from that smart, ready setup, gatewayless, to full smart, you start to add in gateways. Now, from YPASS perspective, a gateway is a device that passes data from the network to the back end. The back end receives the data, does business analytics, makes decisions, and pushes actions back down into the network itself. Now, YPASS itself does not make any hardware. We are a software company, specifically firmware. But we have realized we need to help the gateway guys by providing reference gateway software. And our Linux reference gateway software is open source and it's available on GitHub. Also, for your reference on GitHub, we do have some example applications too. Now, the gateways uh, are there to pass the data back and forth. You need at least one gateway, but you don't normally do that because of uh, throughput and also because of uh, single point of failure. And the great thing about, or one of the many great things about YPASS is you can keep adding more gateways and the network will auto balance itself across the available gateways. As we keep moving further to the right, um, I did say that YPASS doesn't do any dashboards. That's correct. We leave that to our very strong ecosystem partners. That said, we do have a couple of tools such as the YPASS positioning engine. This is used for receiving RSSI data from the network to make decisions about position and it spits out an XY coordinate on an indoor map for asset tracking. And the second tool is the YPASS network tool, WNT. This is not used to control or configure the network because the network is self-forming and it makes all decisions locally. WNT is there for monitoring how is my network performing? What is the topology? What is the health of the network? And sitting at the top of the slide, you, you see a few examples of uh, hardware partners. So as, as mentioned, and just to be completely clear, YPASS doesn't make any hardware. We'll leave that to our partner ecosystem. And there you've got examples from ELA, Fujitsu, Haltian, and Treon. And we have many other guys as well. And finally, as I said, YPASS doesn't make any dashboards, but we have partners in our ecosystem who do that. So that really concludes the introduction about YPASS and what we're doing. I will come back a bit later to talk about use cases, but before doing so, I'd like to hand over to Johannes. We'll talk about the IoT market and particularly about projects. Thanks, Alan. Um, so I'm going to start with a slide that you've probably seen before in one shape or form. Um, but the reason for bringing it up, I think there is no harm in, in reminding ourselves what we're a part of, but it's also about the feeling, you know, it's not just about the opportunity that's in the market, but it's about 
it's about the the feeling that we have when we talk about IoT when we go about when we go about our business. Um, so what you've got here is the latest prediction from Gartner, which predicts 75 billion connected devices by uh, 2025, um, which is a lot of devices. I think we all we all see that. Um, these sort of predictions started becoming popular maybe around about six years ago when Gartner first predicted 50 billion devices by 2020. Um, but actually what we've seen is a little bit different. Um, in, the reality has actually been that whilst they have predicted 50 billion devices to be connected in 2020, the, the number is, is more like 20 billion. And the news of this prediction being wrong is much is, you know it was much quieter than than actually the than actually the the news of of the prediction at the time you know it's it's a lot people people prefer to talk about um people prefer to talk about the bold prediction and not so much about when they when they were wrong um but i think there is some feeling certainly in some parts of the market that iot so far hasn't lived up to the promise because there are there are some real challenges when moving to scaling it up uh, and here is a survey, admittedly not the most recent one, but you know these are the types of things that generally stop IoT adoption being security costs, knowledge, infrastructure, lack of standard and benefits. And we can we can group those essentially into two general themes. The first one is we don't know how to do IoT. So examples of that are, for example, security. Um, examples of that are, are knowledge. Um, they're all they're all just really problem problems of lacking know-how within the organization. Um, and the second group of issues is we we don't really know why, or at least we don't know why to do it with a sense of urgency. Um, and examples of that are not quite seeing the benefits or being worried that it's going to cost so much. Um, and and that's what we're going to start talking about real real quickly. First of all. Um, looking at looking at the technology adaption co curve, which is a fairly standard thing again that I'm sure many of you have seen before, um, and this is this is this is how how we see it. Um, but I think it's it's fairly uncontroversial. We're currently in a state where IoT is fairly mature in in the sense that it's no longer it's no longer the domain of early innovators you know there is there is plenty of technology out there and i think wirepass is a fantastic example of something that 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 enables wider iot adoption at a much faster rate than 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 you would have ever been able to 5 or 10 years ago um but it it hasn't really quite reached the mainstream it's not really something that you 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 see at the forefront of of every company, certainly not in B2B. And I mean, certainly there is so much opportunity. We, you know, we, we talk about it, like I speak to Alan about it all the time, about, about how much opportunity there still is in, in different markets. And um, one of the driving forces um, towards making IoT more mainstream is of course technology. Um, there is a certain inherent complexity in, in, any, in anything that's IoT. So in connecting a potentially low power device, potentially a large number of them, you know, in, in Wirepass's case, we're talking, for example, about connecting a million smart meters onto a single network. And no doubt that is that is an intrinsically hard problem. And as time progresses, thing technology advances, things get easier. And today, of course, there is no doubt that it's much, much easier to do any sort of IoT project than it would have been three to six years ago and again even just looking at wirepass i mean three years ago wirepass would have been around but of course they didn't have they didn't have as many tools they weren't they weren't as as visible perhaps six years ago that the choice may have been much much slimmer um there's also no doubt that if you were to wait longer let's say another five years more, more technology will develop wirepass will get even better um and and things will get easier but right now i think we're at a point where uh, where most iot ambitions are very much within the realm of what is what is achievable more than achievable in fact it's not trivial i think you know that's that's kind of the purpose of this talk we're going to talk about some of the things that are still really important when you're dealing with with cutting edge projects which many of many iot projects still are but it's it's definitely very 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 doable, and so I think now is actually a really great time to 
to get involved and start working on something before it becomes before it becomes so mainstream that you're late to the party but after you know a lot of the mistakes have been made a lot of the technology has been developed um so i'll hand hand back over to alan who's going to share a couple of those success stories yeah thanks johannes i'm going to be talking about uh, three particular case studies across various uh, markets where we focus the first one is smart meters and um we have a uh, very successful customer called Idon, who's a Finnish smart meter maker, and they won a contract for over 1.5 million smart meters for Norway. That number's grown since, and Ypass is in each of those 1.5 million meters and more. But more specifically, uh, we, there's a deployment in the greater Oslo area where there are 700,000 smart meters in one monolithic Ypass mesh. Now you might ask yourself, do all my networks need to be 700,000? Not at all. If you start with 10, 20, 30,000, whatever, then of course, you know you won't fall over. And with the uh, Ypass network, we've been able to offer IDON and the utility 100% coverage and a service level agreement of more than three nines. And what's key here, guys, of course, is uh, once you have your hardware deployed out there, it's going to be out there for five, 10, 15 years. Who knows? It might be you want to update the software, for example, the application software or the mesh software. And that's fully doable with Wirepass using over-the-air updates, OTA. The second use case goes to the Industry 4.0 uh, vertical. And here we're talking about remote condition monitoring. One of our customers called uh, Salts has been working closely with a partner of ours called Treon. And there, Salts are, of course, a big shipper of pumps. And once those pumps are deployed, they have a lifetime. You need to make sure they are maintained and looked after properly. And having somebody walk around with a clipboard and pen to sort of note if there's any vibration or leakages is open to human error. So together with Treon, using Ypass Mesh, they developed a uh, device, battery-powered sensor that attaches to the uh, top of the, the pump. And that's used for detecting vibrations and so on and so forth. And all that data or KPIs is passed back from node to node through the gateway or gateways to the back up to the back hall where uh, data analytics is done and you can sort of check the performance of a particular pump to see how it's doing and based on what's happened before you might say hey this particular pump's profile is having something that looked like we saw before two weeks ago on another pump which failed and immediately you can send people around to fix it and avoid downtime and avoid costs Third example is about acid tracking. And here, working closely with one of our partners called WakeCap, they have these caps as shown on the, this gentleman's head here. And at the back of that cap is a 2.4 gigahertz Ypass device that they designed. And that is used for doing acid tracking through the construction site to make sure staff are safe and sound. And of course, if that's, that uh, acid tracking device has an accelerometer in it, for example, then it can detect if they've been hit, if they've fallen over, and you can look after the staff properly. Now, of course, constructing a building is one phase in the lifetime of a building. The second phase is taking that building into use. And uh, here, I'd like to talk about one particular case of a building and how we've helped guys with it for smart cases. This is for lighting and beyond. This is actually the UMC or the University Medical Center in Utrecht in the Netherlands. They actually called and said, hey, we have a, a specific request. We'd like to work with Ypass on acid tracking to know where things are in our hospital, such as beds, incubators, and fusion pumps. Because things go missing, we don't know where, where they are. We have to spend more money on capital expense. We want to reduce that. As we can't find things, of course, we have to employ more staff, which has a and increased OPEX. So can you help us to reduce the CAPEX in OPEX with acid tracking? Yes, of course we can using our ecosystem. But it wasn't just about doing that one use case, acid tracking. We realized, of course, we can install luminaires, have them connected. They can become the anchor points for the acid tracking devices. The lights themselves can then become the anchor points for gathering data. And we can even use the Ypass mesh for doing indoor navigation. So this really is an example of an ecosystem play for multiple use cases in a smart building. And again, this is thanks to the collaboration between many people in our ecosystem, such as Inge, Koopman Light, 
Interlight, Fujitsu Trayon, S3, Ocean, and Systematic, for example. At this point, I'd like to hand back to you, Anna, so we'll talk about the uh, project lifecycle. Thanks, Alan. Um, right, so now we've talked a little bit about the about the why, and we've looked at some at some success stories. So now let's talk about the how. So how do you actually successfully execute an IoT project? And we use the word project in a in a broad sense. I mean, you might call it how do you, how do you develop an IoT project? How you how do you roll out a service? You know, it, it depends on what you do. So you know, I'll just use project as a proxy for all of those. Um, we're going to use these four project stages um, to, to go through it. Again, I think that it, everybody has their own little lingo, but these are just the four names that I've chosen. So starting with the, the thing that arguably is the most important part, and that's the organization itself. And of course, the, the organization spans the entire project from start to beginning. And you know, we on the on the many many projects that we've worked on or, or that we've had visibility of, that is the key thing that makes or breaks whether it's going to be a success. And so, these are the main points that that we would actually um, that that we would put there. Um, so, um, first of all, we've got um, we've got existing skill sets within the organization. Um, um, so, Alan, I, I, sorry, I, I think you actually have a different version of the slides than I have. Um, I, uh, but okay, I'll, 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 I'll. So, excuse me if I go through some stuff in the wrong order. So, do you mind just going back to the previous slides, and I'll, I'll go those, go, go through those four in a different order. Um, so, we've got, we've got the existing skill sets that you have within an organization, and that's, I mean, that's obviously really key. If you already have the skills, and if you're a company that is founded around building an IoT project. Um, then you might already have the right skills that you need to to execute the the your, your project. Um, secondly, we've got we've got the willingness to collaborate. Um, that's sort of the other side of the medal of the existing skill sets. If you don't have the skills, where you don't have them, are you willing to and able to collaborate with other people to bring in the to bring in the right skills? So this essentially creates the foundation. Um, this essentially creates the foundation for, 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 for being able to execute, of course, right, having the right skills. And we'll talk about what those are in a minute. And then secondly, on the more soft skill side of things, um, we've got agility. And this is something that gets talked about a lot. But basically, what we're talking about is the ability to adapt quickly to a situation that is bound to change. And a common a common argument here is that for larger organization it's very difficult to be agile but what we've seen happen very successfully and for example um we know of of an you know there, there's these incubators for example lufthansa have, has one um where you you split out a smaller team you you give them a certain directive and then they within that team have the ability to be agile it's very very difficult to get an IoT project off the ground if you're within a large rigid organization. And um, finally, and I know this is almost a, 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 a confrontational point, but finally there is humility, um, which, which is really important, um, which is really important for just, for just realizing our own limitations. Um, and I think, you know, Again, it's it's one of those things that we see so happen so often that you 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 have a company that, in this case, might not have been an IoT or tech company. Even they might have had a certain product that they've built for sixty years. They might have always done things a certain way, and it, at that point, I think it it is very. And I mean, I can I can sympathize. It is very very hard to unlearn that you're now suddenly in a very very different environment where you you can't do all the things by yourself you can't have all the you can't have all the skills um so so that's something that again developing that within the organization understanding that before the word go is extremely important um so now next up it, well next up we need to choose um we need to choose the the project we're actually going to do and um you know, we use the metaphor here of the low-hanging fruit. Um, this is this is again. I mean, this is so fundamental to your chances of success. Of course, um, a good business case 
you know, of course, it fulfills a clear need. It brings clear value, and the the value needs to needs to be well and above the cost. It needs to be technically achievable, which um, which is which is which is a given. But really, what that amounts to is it needs to vary. It needs to tolerate some some variance in cost and schedule. It needs to be robust to re reality, not a hundred percent conforming to your ideas. And the, the example that Alan just gave of the, the hospital UMC in the Netherlands is a really good example um, is because, um, because what they've gone and done, rather than just trying out one use case, um, they've actually gone and um, they've gone and tried several different use cases, such as indoor navigation, such as wireless call buttons, such as lighting control, such as tracking of wheelchairs. And that's not even the whole list. And so by doing that, they're going to get a really, really good feel early on in the game of what the what the value that's worth pursuing is. You know, where are the challenges, and that's you know that's something that we see done very differently a lot of the time. Where rather than doing it like that, you end up with um, you end up with you know going down going down a path for many, 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 many months, sometimes years, before actually even trialing out a use case. Um, I mean, Alan, do you think you could give me presenter, and then I could, I could, I could present my slides, just because I think there, yeah, I think we we might have had a little bit of a saving issue. Um, In the meantime, I'll keep talking. Um, Let's just continue, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so. Um, the next slide, I um, I've got a, I've got a, a Steve Jobs quote. Uh, the the ghost of Steve Jobs still haunts us. I'm sure again, you guys would would have heard a lot of a lot of different sort of quotes um, from from Steve Jobs. And the reason for having it there is not really to say how great it is. And it is a it is a fine quote. But the quote is, you have to start with the customer experience and work backwards to the technology. Um, and essentially. That makes sense. That's something that I hear quoted a lot because, of course, right? I mean, you have to start with the value, and then from the value, you can work backwards to the technology. But the context here is really, really important. Steve Jobs was a computer scientist. To Steve Jobs, the technology was what was extremely obvious. Um, but um, but in reality, you know, this quote often gets quoted by managers who are who are not technologists. And of course, to them, it is the most natural thing to start to start with the value and go from there. Um, but but what what you need is you need you need to have all your all your different teams working together. So you need to have both the technology side covered, and you need to have the 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 value side covered, so that you truly build something that is at both has has the value side, but it's also technically achievable and technically sound. Um, and that's something that we see um, we see we see go wrong a lot. That you either have a company that is very technically driven, and technically driven companies build very technically beautiful products, but they may not be appropriate for the market. Or you have a very market driven company, and very market driven companies um, tend to tend to not um, tend tend to tend to not be as strong on the technology side, and they may end up with a with a project that is just technically not achievable. Um, okay, sorry, Alan. I, I think maybe you go back to presenting. I think that I think it's probably uh, sorry. Sorry for that, everyone. I think we had a had a little mix up here. It's pro probably my fault. Um, Alan, do I need to give you back presenter mode? That'd be great. Yes, please. Um, are you are you are presenter? Thank you. Um, so talking about the skills that you need. Um, uh, there's three different main areas that we're going to talk about, um, being software, hardware, and project. Um, all of these skills are things that you need, essentially, as a minimum to successfully be able to uh, execute an IoT project. And this is actually not even the whole list. You might you might see that data science is missing and business transformation is missing. So some level of appreciation that this is what's going to be needed right from the outset. Um, would it, it is definitely required and and for all of these different areas you have a choice you can build them you can build up the skills in house you can partner 
or you can you can in, 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 and I think this is this is what's becoming more and more possible. You can find a vendor such as Wirepass in the ecosystem that is actually going to supply you with the pieces in that area, and then you actually may find that you can cut out a lot of these skills altogether. Starting then um, with software. Software, I would say you need a particularly wide set of skills, but the upside of software is that if you have a team of smart people, they can do a lot of these. So you might find that a great software engineer can in fact do, do all of these. They may in fact be able to build a smartphone app as well as a cloud application, as well as, as, well as embedded firmware. But you're up against a different problem here, which is that great software engineers are really, really hard to find, and they're really, really choosy about where they work. Um, if you want to find great software engineers, especially if you want to find great senior software engineers, then you're gonna then you're gonna be up against the likes of Google, Apple, and Facebook in a race to hire them, and you're gonna be you're going to be judged by things you never thought like you, you, know, you may be judged by, for example, you know, the location of your office, you know, where, you know, how good your coffee tastes. Um, and this is something that, you know, is, uh, that, that we, we've seen with a couple, again, with a couple of established companies when they say, right, IoT is going to be a core part of our business. We need to hire several software engineers. Well, okay, that makes sense. But are you able to provide an environment? Are you able to attract them? Are you able to provide an environment where they're motivated? And and here is the I think here is the secret to motivating software engineers is that the key thing that motivates most software engineers is learning, is working together with great peers. Um, so if you if you are thinking about building a team and you're thinking about hiring maybe one or two software engineers. It, you, you know, you're, you're, you're probably not providing that environment of, you know, that dynamic environment that a lot of great software engineers will want. What, what you are perhaps providing is responsibility, but that kind of responsibility of saying you are the one person who is responsible for the success and failure of our IoT project, that's not something that software engineers shy away from, but it's also not something that you generally use in that area to attract to attract talent because it's just not valued nearly as highly as the learning opportunity. Moving on to hardware then. Um, hardware is a little bit different in that you're often faced with large one-off expenses and you're often faced with highly specialized knowledge. So um, so in, in so in the so in the realm of hardware, um, you you tend to find that doing stuff in house is even more prohibitive than than for software uh, unless you really know that it's going to be a part of um, it, it's going to be a part of your business you know so that's why there is such a big range of vendors in wirepass's ecosystem of you know of module suppliers gateway suppliers you name it just to avoid those large upfront costs when you're trying to when you're trying to build an IoT product and finally, um, on the project side, um, there are some skills, some competencies you're going to want to develop there. So um, agile and engineering management. So managing these projects, that is probably something that you're going to want to upskill in if, if they're skills that you don't have in your organization already. So taking some time to really learn about how, you know, how, how our projects manage. And I'll talk about a bit of that in a minute. Um, but taking some time on, on about learning, yeah, how to how to run tech projects, how to deal with these ever changing environments, I think is really really key. So if you put that all together, finding the right mix of of where to where to build capabilities in house, how to do it, you know, making sure you only commit to, for example, building a team of software engineers if it is really something that you're you're serious about, putting that level of thought and energy into. Um, and making sure in the end that you build up the right skills within yourself, that makes for a really, really strong foundation for the next steps. And um, I'll let Alan talk a little bit about some of the fantastic ecosystem partners that you can leverage to, to avoid having to acquire all those different skills. Yeah, thanks, Johannes. So as mentioned at the beginning, Wipass is the key, four key focus areas, and one of those is the ecosystem. So I like to say that uh, our ecosystem is there from silicon right through to use case. And I just want to go through the different parts here. And just to say here, guys, this is not at all a comprehensive list of all of the ecosystem partners, not at all. 
that's available on our homepage. So let's start with the chipsets, for example. This is where Wirepass Mesh actually runs on the chipsets. So there we have two very key partners. The first is Nordic Semiconductors, and the second is Silicon Labs. Now, some of our customers are a little bit apprehensive about doing chip down because they see RF as a bit of a black magic. So there we've uh, formed relationships with module guys, such as Fujitsu, Ublox, and others. These contain the Nordic semiconductor chip, for example. As you move further up the stack, you want to put the chipset, the module, into a thing. That thing can be a sensor, a tag, a luminaire. And here I've just listed a couple of guys, for example, ELA from France, who has an excellent portfolio of acid tracking tags, and Heltina has, who has a whole range of different tags for sensoring. Moving further up the stack, of course, we need to get data flowing in and out of the network through gateways. And here, I'd like to talk about two partners. One is Solid Run from Israel, and the other is Option Belgium. And at the very, very top, of course, the whole purpose of getting your mesh talking and passing data through the gateways is to get the data, to analyze it, to make decisions, and to put the, push those decisions back to the network through the concept of dashboards, such as Systematic, the guys we used uh, for the UMG case in Giles in France. Okay, so there you are, you've made your decision, you've chosen Wirepass, you've selected a good ecosystem a guy to work with, now you just need to start to move over to actually executing the project. Right, exactly. Um, so, and this is something I, that, that is probably familiar to some of you, but it's, it's still, when it comes to execution, it is one of the, one of the most misunderstood and one of the most uh, incorrectly executed parts of, of how to run a project. Um, so what you see on the right is what's called the waterfall model. Um, it's something that 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 was, you know, I, whether whether you can even say it was invented, it's almost the, the way that we've always been taught how to do things. And the way that goes is you start with the requirements, so you start with thinking about what, what does it need to do, then you go move over to the specification, how is it going to do it, then you start working on it. Um, and again, I mean, this is this is so so prevalent because it works in some areas, or in some other areas, it is actually the only way to do it. And I think an example that gets commonly used is building a house. Um, when you build a house, you probably want to start with a with a strong plan. That's why you have architects, uh, and that's maybe why why most houses look very much the same. And if you end up in, if you end up with a cutting edge architecture project, it's going to cost you. Um, but the problem with this is that it, it, it almost never works for tech projects unless they're very, very clear from the outset. And what that tends to mean is that they're very, very, very done, that they're very common, common types of projects. Um, essentially, the reason it breaks and the reason it hasn't really worked and that's been recognized since the 90s is that you cannot really know your requirements at the outset and then you cannot from that move to the specification and you'll just build something that is increasingly wrong. And the alternative to that is iterative development. You know, sometimes that's used interchangeably with the term agile development, but basically what that's all about is, is having a cycle where you build something, you test it as quickly as possible, you learn from that and then you continue to build upon that. Um, and, and just on that, I mean, um, so, when you're gathering requirements um, on the next slide, that's um, that's essentially that's essentially what it tends to look like. You you come up you come up with some set of requirements, and there is some amount of overlap with with the real requirements. But I would say this picture is pretty much to scale. I think the the area of the overlap, even if you are quite expert in 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 your field, um, unless you're building something that is literally a copy of something that's existed before. You tend, up, you tend to end up with a, with a small level of overlap. And this is where the humility that I mentioned earlier comes in to accept that, to not go and say, I'm going to fight this, I'm going to fight this rule that, is, that, 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 that has been seen across so many projects over the last 30 years, 40 years, and I'm going to try to get it right because I know better. And, and, and these rules don't apply to me. You know, the, the much better thing here to do is to say, I will accept that we're unable to fully specify a project at the start. Um, instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to embrace an iterative mindset. I'm going to embrace learning as we go along. And this is something that that really avoids 
the, the problem that again you see so often that something gets built for eight months and in the ninth month in the ninth month you find out that what you've built is the wrong thing the quality isn't right you know there is some there's some sort of issues with it so one of the things there to decide because a common objection to agile development as well but we can't do it because we have a particular schedule or we have a particular budget right our budget is infinite or we know what the product or what the product needs to do well okay um but think of this triangle so there is cost schedule and product and the product encompasses what it does and the quality of it what you can do when you're running an iterative project or any project with uncertainty is you can hold on to one or two of those corners at most so you might be able to say i am going to i have a fixed schedule and i have a fixed budget and you hold on to those two corners but then the third corner of the product is going to float which means you will use an iterative approach to build the best product that you can at that time which is what it's designed to do but of course you know, from the outset, you may not know 100% what the product is going to look like um, because you don't know all of those learnings. Again, <laughs> humility. Um, this, this is this is the way that software projects and and cutting edge projects have gone. And I mean, your your IoT project may vary in those characteristics depending on how how much of an unknown and how much of a known component there is. But but as a general rule of thumb, I think it's good to always keep the keep the triangle in mind and make sure that you're aware which corners you're holding on to. So then once we've gotten this far, we can execute. And so we've already know we already know that we are going to execute iteratively. And the goal, as we said at the start of the presentation, is to do it in months so how to do how to execute iteratively and how to deliver something in months um so the natural the, uh, there is a a natural way on the next slide which is um building it like a house very much which is which is vertically um and the way that a the way that a house traditionally gets built uh, is you start you start and then you start laying the foundation then you build from the top up it's not like you build a house by saying i'm going to build the bathroom and then i'm going to build the first bedroom and i'm going to build the second bedroom it, it doesn't work like that um, so this is how a lot of tech projects go and this is again another really really common mistake that really stops your ability to, to learn quickly and to execute the project quickly where the first thing you do is you say i'm going to develop the hardware and then you say, I'm going to put connectivity on top of that. So you get wire pass. And then you say, okay, now I have all of this working. I start working on the software. And finally, at the very end, you have a product and you give it to a customer. And you might say this is iterative because you could say that every of these chunks is, is an iteration. But the key problem here is that we only really learn at the end. By the time it's in the customer's hands, that's the point where finally you'll see have we built the right thing? And from what, what I've said earlier, that's exactly not what we want. Instead, what we do is we build horizontally. So at each step, we try and build a really thin, you might call it a vertical slice. We try and build something that is, that is, that is very lean in each area, but that actually is to a point where even if you don't show it to a customer, and of course you don't, you won't necessarily release a product from your first iterations, but to get it to a point where you can test it out, you can test it with real people as quickly as possible. And at each step, you learn and you figure out, you know, you figure out what product it is you need to build, how that relates to what you've currently got. You become smarter and smarter and your product becomes better and better at each step. Now, um, there is a lot of objections to this type of, um, to this type of thing. And so, what I'm going to give you here is just three techniques to make sure that you can build these vertical slices and you don't have to end up building your project like a house. And the first one is not to reinvent the wheel. Um, and I think for a lot of the mistakes we see, there are fairly well known psychological biases. And, you know, here, for example, it, it is very easy to say, well, 
I have a product in mind. It needs to do X, Y, and Z. It needs to look exactly like that. And we need to build that. And building the hardware is going to cost $500,000 and it's going to, going to take eight months. But we, know, we think this needs to happen. And our brain will gravitate towards things that give us certainty. And the, there's a fairly certain outcome of building something for $800,000, depending on what it is, but you know you're gonna get $800,000 worth of product. It's gonna give you a sense of security because nobody else has your $800,000 product. Um, and, and that's something that, that, that many, many, many managers, many, many people doing these projects again and again are tempted to go for. However, a lot of the time there is hardware off the shelf. There is wire pass already out there. There is software on top of WirePass that you can use to actually test out your value proposition, sometimes without writing a single line of code, building a single piece of hardware, piecing together something, you know, and getting creative there. It, it really, again, it, like what, what it does is it, it creates this learning early. It's a very scary prospect to go out and, and validate your ideas like that, especially if they're not entirely what you'd like them to be. But that's you know there's so many opportunities missed here that that we see lead to lead to projects being um yeah to projects being being developed unnecessarily. The second one, and that's one that we've used to a great extent, is using over the air updates. So what that lets you do is it lets you ship software that isn't a hundred percent finished or that you know you're going to want to update in the future at least, uh, and update them in the field. Um, and that, you know, Wirepass has a, has a terrific over the air update functionality built in, which is, um, which, which really allows you to, to go and deploy. We've done this recently where we've deployed a, a site with over a thousand devices, knowing that part of this process will be learning and testing and that, you know, in, at, at a rhythm of days, we're going to be able to push out updates, learn more and make it, make it into something that's really good in a way that we would never have been able to do in, in, in anywhere near that amount of time had we done it in a lab. And finally, um, finding early adopters. So making sure that you can find people that become part of the process. And again, this falls into the category of something that we tend to naturally shy away from because getting feedback is difficult. You know, Working with people outside of your project is difficult, but there is actually a world of people out there who are keen to get the latest technology, be part of it, even in B2B world, right? We're not just talking about smartwatches here. Even when we're talking about, you know, IoT and commercial settings, there are so many companies out there that have, have facilities managers that have a, a clear directive to be part of innovation, trial the latest technologies. And if you're able to find those early on in the projects, make them part of the project, you can learn so much quicker than the worst case, which again is something we've, we've seen has happened to us, is that you've developed a product and by the time it's ready to be trialed, you don't have any, you haven't, you haven't gone through this process, you don't have any friendly sites, you don't have anybody who's willing to to go out and test things for you. And at that point, it becomes really, really difficult to progress to the next step. And finally, just to highlight some of the amazing tools that Wirepass gives us in this regard. Um, two ones that I think, and, and Alan has mentioned these, but I think I just wanna add my, my personal take on them. I mean, Wirepass positioning engine is Wirepass's tool for asset tracking. And that's really a terrific, a terrific tool that we've used in so many different settings. Because what it does is it allows you to basically add asset tracking to your existing Wirepass solution almost for free. There is no, I mean, there is a there is a license cost for it, but 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 starting to starting out um, with Wirepass positioning engine is is extremely fast. You don't need to modify your application, and you can trial all these different asset tracking applications really really quickly. Um, which, 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 you know, it, it just really opens up a whole world of use cases. Um, and then secondly, Wirepass network tool, which gives you insight into your network. Again, such an invaluable tool when what we're talking about is it deploying quickly, learning quickly, you know, you're going to be managing in no time, a fleet of different networks, some of them with thousands or even tens of thousands of devices, you're going to want to know especially in you know with a product that's not yet fully matured 
um, which your project likely won't be if you if you started developing it uh, months ago. Is it is it doing what I expect? Is the network is the network um, being used the way it should be? Um, and this gives you that insight. So it means that you know you can have perfect peace of mind, leverage updates. And, and and you know these things are so key for for developing for developing quickly. So finally, um, I just want to say a couple of words about what we do. Um, and in in short, I, IoT is what we do. We have skills in almost all of those areas that are on this slide. Where we don't have the skills, we partner with people who do. Um, I think by now you'll have learned a lot about our philosophy and how we do things and the, the values we we bring into a project um, but what we really see ourselves as is the missing puzzle piece for, for a lot of the, the partners that we work with so if you already have a set of engineering skills for example you might have you might be very competent at hardware but not at software we'll fill in that bit if you have all those skills and you need help pulling together the right pieces from the Wirepass ecosystem to build a solution, to trial something early on, you know, we have those skills. Um, so for us, you know, for us, we love to work with customers at, at, at all different stages and help them accelerate their IoT journey. Um, and what I'll do uh, after, the, after this webinar is we'll send you a case study of how we did that with one of our partners called Ingi, which got mentioned once or twice in this call. Great, thank you. Okay, thank you, Johannes. I think now we have time for a few questions. Just let me look at the drop-down menu. Give me a moment. Okay, uh, one of the first questions we got there, I think that's for me, is about um, asset tracking. Uh, there's a question about the accuracy. So if there's one thing you take from this call about, Wirepass asset tracking is uh, five, five, five. The first five is we promise an accuracy of five meters when the anchors are positioned about 10 to 15 meters apart. We can go a bit lower, of course, but there are limitations of uh, RSSI. The second five there is about uh, the update rate. So we're not doing updates every second or every 30 seconds. This is about an update rate of uh, every five minutes. And often when we speak to customers about their use case, this idea of five meter accuracy and updates every five minutes is perfectly valid for them. And the third five there is uh, offering the whole network battery powered um, for a time period of five years. I think now we've got time for one more question. Let me see there. Okay, there's a question about um, uh, gateways and the number of nodes per gateway. Now, of course, this all depends on how much data is flowing. And uh, this is why we say that uh, for our system, you know, we don't just have one gateway. The more gateways you add, the more data that will flow. And uh, we have cases, for example, where we have uh, hundreds of nodes behind a gateway. And actually, I've got one question for you, Johannes. Sure, shoot. Okay. The question is, um, based on all the projects you've been having with different sorts of customers from different uh, market verticals, what sort of feedback have you been getting about uh, Wirepass? Oh, um, <laughs> well, mostly, uh, let, let, let me have a think. I mean, I think, um, I think obviously, um, I mean, at a, you know, first of all, I think the technology is pretty amazing. I think one thing that I always like to talk about when, when talking about Wirepass is it's a little bit of a connoisseur's product in the sense that it you 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 know when you use Wirepass, it's it's so it does it does, you know, and this is this goes back to what you talked about at the start, it does so many things so automatically, you know, and 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 it, it doesn't have, you know, and, and we've got a history of working with different mesh um, mesh solutions. Um, it does so many things so automatically, like the formation of the network, picking channels, you know, that if you've never had the problems that it solves, you know, you're lucky because you will never have them. Um, so I think, you know, I think people love Wirepass. I think, I, I think the really, really there is, you know, the, the, this final level of, this final level of appreciation, I think you'll probably only get from the people who've who've been who've been who've been doing this for a while who've been trying it and who really know what the alternative looks like of worrying about what have you know i mean and I've, you know we've said we've had projects where we stood with a hard hat in a construction site 
you know, praying that the network will hold up. And that wasn't, that wasn't why I passed it. That was, um, the, you know, knowing, knowing that, uh, you know, for certain applications in particular, such as asset tracking, I think, you know, I think there is almost no words that I can, I can use to describe the, 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 the peace of mind that Wirepass brings for you. So the feedback that we've gotten was very positive for sure. I mean, it's worked, but I think people expect it to work. It's, it's almost, you know, it's almost, it, I think that's probably the, be, the greatest thing I can say about Wirepass is that it's, it's so good that it almost just becomes something that, that, that people expect to, 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 to work perfectly every time. And, and yeah, so, so it's almost something that, when we're working on something we don't need to think about and it get it gets out of the way of the application that we're developing with our partners um exactly. that's, that's so the most amazing thing yeah okay guys um just two final things from my side the first one is that um we have an event an online event happening called wirepass go this is happening next wednesday that's wednesday the 10th of june uh it's an open event you're more than welcome to register for it uh, via our homepage through the news and webinars section. We have something like uh, four 35 companies presenting. We've got various tracks there, including smart lighting, smart tracking, ecosystem, and so on. And the final thing from my side is to say, when you think of Wirepass, absolutely think of mesh connectivity, but also think about the ever-growing ecosystem we have and how we can work together to do multiple use cases for your particular vertical. So guys, if you have any final questions or questions after the webinar, don't hesitate to email Johannes and me. For today, I'd like to say thank you. Thanks everyone. And thanks of course to, to Mimi and, and you, Alan, for organizing this. Okay, great, thank you guys. Thank you.